Please stand for the call to worship. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. Let us worship the Lord. Our first hymn is number 64, O God be all praising. Friends, when we gather to praise God, we remember that we are people who have preferred our own ways to his. Accepting his wish to make us new persons in Christ, let us confess our sins before God and one another. We do not presume to come this able, O oh merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, and in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much to the other that runs under your table. For you are the same Lord whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, grant the bud that our single bodies may be reclaimed by his body our souls washed through his most precious blood, that we may ever dwell in him and he in us. Hear our petitions, O God, as we continue to pray in silence. Brothers and sisters, hear the good news of the gospel. Jesus lived for us. Jesus died for us. Jesus was raised in glory for us. Hear this good news and believe it. In Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. The peace of God be with you all. Let us offer signs of peace and reconciliation.
Please be seated and join in the prayer for illumination. Almighty God, you have spoken to us through your Son. Let your written word now be spoken and heard by each of us. Give us ears to hear and hearts to understand. You may not refuse your calling or ignore your voice. Make our every thought captive to the love of Jesus Christ, for we pray in your holy name. Amen. The first lesson is from James 2 and starts with verses 1 through 10. My brothers and sisters, Believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there, or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into the court? Are they not the ones who are placifying the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. The second part comes from James 2, verses 14 through 17. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Our second reading today comes from the Gospel of Mark. We're in chapter 7, and we'll begin reading at verse 24. Let us continue now to listen for the word of God to us on this day. And there Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice, but a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, for saying that you may go, the demon has left your daughter. So she went home and found the child lying on the bed and the demon gone. This is the word of the Lord. A bad day at the office or at school, the factory, the hospital, the restaurant, the station, wherever it is that we happen to work. Or if we don't work anywhere, maybe it's just a plain old bad day right there at home. We all know how it goes. You get out of bed, stub your toe and the leg at the table you forgot about moving the night before. Hurt so bad you start hopping around in one foot until that sudden crunch tells you you've stepped on your glasses. Frame twisted, one side broken. Stumble into the bathroom, scald yourself in the shower, slip on the soap, hit your funny bone on the edge of the grab bar. 
<laughs> anyone could see it's going to be a bad day. With any sense at all, you just call it quits and go back to bed. But most of the time, most of us persevere, heading out the door, thinking, well, maybe it won't be so bad after all. That is, until the bozo in the car in front of you jams on his brakes for no apparent reason, you manage to stop in time to avoid a crash, but only at the cost of spilling hot coffee all over your nice, clean shirt. The boss waiting at the door, asking where you've been, telling you he needs that project you've been working on today. So you turn on the computer, file nowhere to be found. Searching frantically through cyberspace for two weeks worth of spreadsheets, finally calling the IT guy. Oh yes, he says, there's been a glitch. Some of our files have been compromised. I say all this because we all have one now and then, a bad day. Kind of makes me wonder about Jesus. Do you think he ever had a bad day? A day when nothing turned out right? Our story from the Gospel of Mark, it's notorious among Bible scholars. It's the one place in all of Scripture where we just might get the idea that Jesus was having a bit of a bad day. A day when he's feeling overworked, tired, a little too much in demand, as it were. At the beginning of today's text, Jesus has just come from yet another confrontation with the scribes and Pharisees, this time defending his disciples against charges of breaking the tradition of the elders by eating with unclean hands. From there, Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre, says Mark. The region of Tyre, an ancient city on the Mediterranean to the northwest of Galilee, a land of heathens from the Jewish perspective, and moreover, traditional enemies spoken against by the prophets Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Joel, Amos. So Jesus, for Jesus to go away to the region of Tyre, that in itself is making a statement. He's crossing a border, a boundary, a dividing line between his people and a foreign country, alien, distant, strange, a land largely Gentile and despised by the Jews, as the footnote in the study Bible says. Surely in this land, he may have been thinking, surely way out here in the middle of nowhere, I can get just a little peace and quiet. As his ministry develops, the crowds become an oppressive element for Jesus, especially according to the Gospel of Mark. It's kind of an interesting development, wouldn't you say? Here he is, an itinerant preacher, complaining because the crowds coming to see him are too big. Our guys today know that the audience can never be too big. Just keep renting a larger facility. But Jesus seems to dislike these crowds for several reasons. From one perspective, they quite simply threaten to overwhelm his work in ministry. He can't travel freely, cannot come and go as he pleases. Why, just making his way from one place to the next often becomes a complicated undertaking. Can't find time for himself, time to rest, time to pray, time to figure out just exactly who he is and what he ought to be doing next. And then there's that nagging concern about the motivations of the crowd. Jesus feared that they're inspired by all the wrong reasons, looking for miracles like some kind of magic trick, looking for food to feed their bellies as with the feeding of the 5,000. And so we find this continuing sense of Jesus trying to escape the crowds, trying to get away from the too pressing crush of popularity. 
So now Jesus even goes to the extent of traveling to a foreign country. And he entered a house, says the text, and did not want anyone to know where he was. He entered a house. It must surely have been the home of a Jew, scholars insist. For there were Jews living out there, even in that Gentile land, but it would have been a remote existence, cut off from fellow Jews in Jerusalem and even in Galilee. And so this homeowner, whoever he was, would have been someone willing to forgo the pleasure, the convenience, the orthodoxy of being in the majority, of being part of the in crowd, Anyway, there he is, Jesus in a strange land, entering a house, a Jewish enclave in a pagan country, not wanting anyone to know he was there. Now, it's tempting to see Jesus as having some kind of special foreknowledge, as knowing in advance everything that is to happen before it comes about, kind of like an actor with a complete script for a role he's played through many times. But another way to think about it, in a way that's truer to the text and more defensible to the theological assertion that Jesus is fully human, this other way is to say that, yes, Jesus has a general sense of who he is and what he's up to, as do we all. But as to the particulars, he's being guided along the way by events as they develop. Call it the hand of God, if you like, leading Jesus into an ever-deepening understanding of his mission, purpose, and role. Guided at times through this process, even against his wishes. Guided into places he'd rather not go. And so we see Jesus retreating to the region of Tyre with the clear expectation of remaining unrecognized with the certain hope of a little rest and relaxation. But such is not to be. For no sooner does his head hit the pillow than the phone begins to ring or would have if they had had phones back then. Yet he could not escape notice, says Mark, but a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him. This woman, we know next to nothing about her, except Mark specifically identifies her as a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. Mark wanting to make it clear that this woman is not a Jew, not one of the chosen people, not part of the in crowd. Moreover, she is a woman (laughs) coming alone, that is to say, unescorted into the presence of a strange man. Even just that suggests she's probably a widow or worse, a woman having no man to go with her, to protect her, to speak for her. And how does she get into the presence of Jesus? We don't know. Text doesn't say. But if we are correct in picturing a Jewish enclave in a Gentile country, it seems unlikely that Syrophoenician women would ordinarily be coming and going from such a house, kind of like the present-day Palestinians seeking to enter a Jewish house on the occupied West Bank. It's not likely to happen, certainly not since October of last year. So who knows? She enters maybe barging in the front door, maybe sneaking in the back way. In any case, her presence, in his presence, is a sign, an indication of her desperation on behalf of her daughter, the one with the unclean spirit. So we can well suppose that all this has been going on for some time, this problem with her daughter. And we can imagine her having availed herself of all the usual means, whatever they may have been in that time and day, exorcisms, healings, 
the priests, one man of medicine after the other, when we're sick, when our child is sick, and we've exhausted all the usual means of healing, the doctors, the clinics, the hospitals, and still she's sick and nothing seems to work. And the little girl with the unclean spirit, what are we to think about her? Linda Blair, head spinning, cursing like a sailor, throwing up green pea soup, or maybe an anorexic daughter reduced to skin and bones, but still convinced she's fat, refusing all sustenance, even to the point of starvation. Or the sexually abused preteen curled up on her bed in fetal position, catatonic. Or the depressed 16-year-old refusing to leave her heavily shuttered bedroom, making a series of cuts on her arm with a razor blade, each deeper than the last. You tell me, how do we bring healing to situations such as these? Also, think about it. You're the parent, a single mother, and you've heard about this man who's come to town, a stranger, a Jew. And you find out where he's staying, and you're desperate. So you find a way to slip in. And before you know it, you're bowing at his feet, begging him to cast the demon out of your daughter. And Jesus, what about him? What does all this look like from his point of view, the great physician? Is it kind of like the doctor saying goodbye to the last patient from his or her crowded waiting room at 7.15 p.m., even though office hours are supposed to be over at 5, heading over to the hospital to check on his or her patients over there, the ones complaining about not having seen the doctor since yesterday, finally starting home at about a quarter past nine, only to be accosted in the parking lot by a woman, a strange woman, going on and on about her daughter, demanding... He or she come and help this daughter. Bad day at the doctor's office. So he says it. Jesus does. Surely the harshest, the hardest, the most unfeeling comment recorded anywhere in Scripture is coming out of the mouth of our Lord. Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. One of those stinging remarks, one of those things you hear and it makes you cringe, but you hear, can't quite believe what you've heard. Well, as we said to start with, everyone has a bad day now and then. One of the points that we insist on with Jesus that the theologians tell us that we repeat in the Nicene Creed, he was fully human. And I suggest Jesus would not be fully human if he did not have a bad day on occasion, if he didn't maybe say things he would later wish he had put them a little bit differently. So no, I'm not surprised at what Jesus says. Rather, what surprises me is Mark recording what Jesus said here in the gospel. Think about it. There were hundreds and hundreds of things Jesus said and did during his three years of ministry. Compared to all of that, Mark's gospel is a rather short piece of writing. Clearly, he's picking and choosing the things to put in and the things to leave out the words to record, to write down, and the words to just leave unmentioned. And yet Mark ends up including this surprisingly harsh statement in which Jesus speaks of a woman and her sick daughter as dogs. Why? How? To what purpose? 
One of the good things about reading the Bible, as compared to most other books, you never have to worry about the absence of speculation. I'd venture to say there's not a single sentence or passage anywhere in the whole Bible that hasn't been read and noticed and studied a hundred times over in the past 2,000 years. So then, here's one of the most common theories about this passage. Jesus was just testing her, wanted to see how strong her faith really was. Well, maybe, but it seems a rather cruel kind of test. There must have been other ways to find out about her faith. And why would it matter anyway? Why give such a test in the first place? And then there's the linguistically based explanation arguing that the Greek word for dog really applies to a pet, to a household animal. But the point is, Jesus calls her a dog. And it means the same thing back then in the Greek that it means today in the English. And the socioeconomic explanation claiming that the Jews living in the, quote, region of Tyre were most likely peasants living on the land as what we would call sharecroppers, watching the produce of their hard work being sent to the city to feed wealthy Gentiles while their own people went hungry. And thus the present petitioner the woman, happens to be called a dog as part of an ongoing class struggle. And there are more, I am sure, lots and lots of explanations, all seeking to save Jesus from the presumption that he must have been having a bad day, seeking to exonerate him from the thought that as soon as he uttered these words, he maybe wished he hadn't. You know how things sometimes come out in ways you didn't intend, how they sound harder spoken than you expected, how you yourself are sometimes surprised to hear the anger in your own voice. Surprised because you've never quite let yourself realize how angry you really are, what with all the people making demands on you all the time, hurting people, sick people, needy people. Does Jesus need us to protect him from this level of humanity? Mark apparently sees no reason to accord Jesus such protection. One other thought. When Jesus comes into this world, he comes as a Jew. He pretty clearly understands his role, his ministry, is having the intention of reforming the religion of the Jews. And only through the course of events unfolding, only through the leading of the Spirit, if you will, does he begin to understand a greater purpose, a larger scope to his work. Thus, he ends up in the region of Tyre in a pagan land of the Gentiles, not by chance, not by accident, but because God has bigger plans for his son than even that son himself first realizes. And that poor, single, unprotected woman, she finds her way into that Jewish home Yes, because she's concerned about her daughter, but also because she has a role to play in the expansion of Jesus' ministry. In other words, God uses her to help his son understand he has been sent as the bread of life, not just to the children of Israel, but to all people everywhere, even to the ones who, on a bad day, you might happen to call dogs. That poor woman, that desperate mother, God gives her the wit, the wisdom, the wherewithal to answer Jesus in the terms of his same metaphor. Yes, Lord, says she, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. 
And as he hears these words, Jesus becomes suddenly aware. And maybe that's really what makes him so different from the rest of us. His bad day doesn't last but a minute. Jesus adjusting quickly and easily to a new insight, to a new reality. Then Jesus said to her, as Mark reports, for saying that you may go, the demon has left your daughter. So she went home and found the child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Of dogs and crumbs and bad days turn good. Thank you. 
And now let us stand as we affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. God of compassion, your son gives rest to those weary with heavy burdens. Heal the sick in body, mind, and spirit. Lift up the depressed. Befriend those who grieve. Comfort the anxious. Stand with all victims of abuse and other crime. Fill all people with your Holy Spirit that they may bear each other's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Eternal God, your love is stronger than death, your passion more fierce than the grave. We rejoice in the lives of those whom you have drawn into your internal embrace. Keep us in joyful communion with them until we join the saints of every people and nation gathered before your throne in ceaseless praise. God of glory, you see how all creation groans in labor as it awaits redemption. As we work for and await your new creation, we trust that you will answer our prayers with grace and fulfill your promise that all things work together for good for those who love you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
My friends, we gather at this table to share a holy meal. It's a feast to which Jesus invites us. And there's a place right here with your name on it. We've all got a place at this table, a place of welcome where everyone feels at home because it is indeed our home, first, last, and always. And so, my friends, let us come to the table bringing all that we are and all we ever hope to be. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets, who looked for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, and on these your gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ and one with each other until Christ comes in final victory. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Let us pray now as our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Dearly beloved, on the night of his arrest, our Lord took bread, and when he had given thanks, 
he broke that bread and he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body broken for you. Eat of this in remembrance of me. Also after that supper, our Lord took a cup and said to his disciples, this cup is a new covenant poured out for you in my blood. Drink all of you from this cup in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we show forth the Lord's death until he comes again in glory. My friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Penny, the body of Christ broken for you.
Let us pray. Our Father, um, sorry. We thank you, O God, that through word and sacrament, you have given us your Son, who is the true bread from heaven and food of eternal life. Strengthen us in your service, that our daily living may show our thanks through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you for being here for the hearing of the word and the breaking of the bread. I charge us now to go forth seeking to find someone having a bad day and let them know that in spite of all that, Jesus loves them. Jesus loves you. Jesus will keep you, shine his face upon you, and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.